The Barretts of Wimpole Street. In this production of the play by Rudolf Pessier, we present Dorothy Tutin as Elizabeth Barrett, Paul Rogers as her father, Edward Moulton Barrett, and Jeremy Brett as Robert Browning. The year is 1845. The place, London. The action takes place in Elizabeth Barrett's bed-sitting room in her father's house at 50 Wimpole Street. Elizabeth lies on her sofa. Seated beside her is Dr. Chambers, who is feeling her pulse. Hmm, yes. It's this increasingly low vitality of yours that worries me. No life in your, none. What are we going to do about it? Well, Dr. Chambers, if you shut a person up in one room for years on end, you can't very well expect to find her bursting with life and vigor. Why not prescribe something really exciting for a change? Exciting, eh? A gallop three times round the park every morning, dumbbell exercises, a course of calisthenics, a long sea voyage. Oh, I wish I could, my dear. It's funny to think of it now, but you know, Doctor, as a child, I was a regular tomboy. And mentally, you're a tomboy still. <laughs> uh, to tell you the truth, Miss Barr... Oh, forgive me, my dear Miss Elizabeth. That quaint nickname of yours slipped out unawares. To tell you the truth, I'm not sure that brain of yours isn't altogether too active. Why not turn your mind to something light and easy for a change? Uh, a poetry. You're not neglecting your poetry, I hope. Meaning something light and easy? <laughs> Oh, Doctor, I must remember to tell that to Mr. Robert Browning when I see him tomorrow. Robert Browning? A brother bar, eh? Oh, don't tell me you've never heard of him. Well, my dear, poetry isn't much in my line, you know. That's evident. All the same, read Mr. Browning's Sordello and then come back and tell me that poetry's light and easy. <laughs> well, well, I suppose we mustn't rob you of your mental exercises if they keep you contented. Contented? Oh, Doctor, I shudder to think what my life would be like if I hadn't a turn for scribbling and study. Mm -hmm. Yes, quite so. Yes, but the fact is you oughtn't to live in England at all. Italy is the place for you. Italy? Oh, Doctor, what a heavenly dream. Yes, and must remain a dream, I fear. Uh, tell me now, Miss Elizabeth, have you ventured on your feet at all lately? No, hardly at all. Papa, as you know, one of my brothers carries me from my bed to the sofa in the mornings and... Back to bed again at night. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when I'm feeling venturesome, my maid supports me across the room. How's the appetite? Just to peck at your food, I suppose? Well, I always try to eat what I'm given, but I'm never very hungry. Oh, Doctor, that reminds me. Do you remember Papa suggesting to you that a kind of beer called porter might do me good? Yes, and an excellent suggestion, Oh, too. but forgive me, it was nothing of a kind. I have to drink it twice a day out of a pewter tanker, and my life in consequence has become one long misery. God bless myself. It's no use my appealing to Papa, especially as the dreadful idea originated with him. But if you, dear, dear Dr. Chambers, were to suggest to him that something else, anything, I don't mind what it is, might be equally efficacious... <laughs> you poor little lady... Of course I will. <laughs> yes, Wilson? Begging your pardon, miss, but the master wishes most particularly to see you before you leave, sir. Uh, of course, of course. Is your master in his study? Yes, sir. Well, uh, goodbye, Miss Elizabeth. Goodbye. Goodbye, Doctor. And you won't forget. Eh? P-O-R-T-E-R. <laughs> I'll speak to him about it oh, now. thank you. Thank you. Good night. Well, you needn't see me downstairs. I know my way. Very good, sir. I was just going to post your letters, Miss Barr. Shall I take Flush with me? Oh, yes, do. The poor little thing needs some exercise. Very good, Miss Barr. Come, Flush. Come along. <laughs> Excuse me, Miss Henrietta. I didn't see you come in. Oh, Barr, dinner was awful, awful. Was Papa? Yes, he was. It was awful. He was in one of his moods, the worst kind. The nagging mood's bad enough. The shouting mood's worse. But don't you think the dumb mood's the worst of yes, all? Yes, perhaps. I don't believe there were more than a dozen remarks all through dinner. The only sound in the room was the discreet clatter of knives and forks. Oh, Barr, well, Dr. Chambers isn't dissatisfied with you. You're not worse. No, no, dear. I'm just the same. Neither better... No worse. 
Oh, you're here, Henrietta. I've been looking for you everywhere. Papa has just sent you this note from his study. Me? Oh, dear. When he starts sending out notes from his study, look out for squalls. I've heard this morning that your cousin Bella and her fiancé, Mr. Bevan, propose to call on you tomorrow at three o'clock. You and Arabelle will, of course, be here to receive them, and if Elizabeth is well enough, you will bring them upstairs to see her, Papa. Oh, but Papa, it's quite impossible. Why couldn't he have spoken at dinner? Heaven knows he had opportunity enough. I'm afraid he was too displeased. Displeased? Oh, of course, we all know that he hates being ordinarily polite to anyone. Now he's simply bound to show some kind of hospitality. No wonder he was displeased. But are you quite fair, Papa? Papa seldom objects to us receiving our friends. For a cup of tea and a bun, and so long as the house is clear of them before he's back from the city. What enrages me is that I was expecting a friend tomorrow at three. Now I shall have to put him off somehow. Why? Why what? Well, why must you put your friend off? Bella and her fiancé won't eat your friend. What business is that of yours? Oh, Henrietta, I didn't... I hate you. people prying into my affairs. Oh, oh Henrietta, dear. Oh, oh dear. Oh, what can be the matter with her tonight? Usually she quite enjoys being quizzed about Captain Surtees' cook. Perhaps she may have begun to take his attentions seriously. But Papa would never countenance any kind of understanding between them. Even if Captain Cook came offering her a coronet instead of being an officer with only a small allowance, it would make no difference. Poor Henrietta. Oh, I'm sorry, Pa. Oh. I'm sorry, Arabelle. Oh, my dear, I never meant to annoy you. You didn't. You displeased me. <laughs> oh, I'm Papa's daughter, all right. <laughs> when Bella and her fiancé call tomorrow, Arabelle will bring them up here to see me. And Henrietta, you can entertain Captain Cook in the drawing room. What a thing it is to be a genius. <laughs> you darling. <laughs> but uh, I must have the room to myself at half past three. As Mr. Robert Browning is calling then. No! But I thought, uh, has Papa given his permission? Of course. But you said yourself only a short time ago that you didn't intend to receive him. I didn't. Uh, and I don't particularly want to now. But why? Because, my dear at heart, I'm as vain as a peacock. Yes, but what is... You see, when people admire my work, they are quite likely to picture the poet as as stately and beautiful as her verses, and it's dreadfully humiliating to disillusion them. Oh, don't be silly, Bar. You're very interesting and picturesque. <laughs> Isn't that how guidebooks usually describe a ruin? Oh, Bar, I didn't mean... Of course not. As a matter of fact, Mr. Browning has been so insistent that out of sheer weariness I've given way. But I don't want an audience to witness the tragedy of his disillusionment. Oh. You mind, Arabelle? Mm -hmm. Bella and her Mr. Bevan must have left the room before he arrives. Come in. Come in, Oki. Okay. I've just, just come to see how you are and to wish you good night. Doctor satisfied? Oh, yes, I think so. Come in. Well, Septimus? How are you, Bar? I hope the doctor is satisfied with you. Oh, yes, I think so. I say, Septimus, the head is the d d dining here in force next Tuesday. By Jove, not with him. Come in, Alfred. And how's our dear Bar tonight? I hope the doctor was happy about you. Oh, yes, I think so. Come in, Charles and Henry. How are you feeling tonight, Bar? I hope Dr. Chambers' report was good. Oh, yes, I think so. I must say, I think you're looking a little better. What do you say, Charles? Eh? Well, looking better, don't you know? More herself, what? Come in, George. Well, and how's Bar tonight? The doctor just beat, hasn't he? I'm afraid he wasn't too pleased with you. Oh, yes, I think so. What? I mean, why? You're not looking so well. Is she, Henry? On the contrary, I think she's looking considerably better. So does Charles, don't you, Charles? Eh? I think it's just possible that you'd all be interested to hear that Papa is going to Plymouth on business next week. Oh, oh, Plymouth. Plymouth. <laughs> go on, George, go on. And? And that he's not expected to return for at least a fortnight. Oh, 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 oh George, how wonderful. Oh, do you poke, George? Oh, don't be childish. Well, I poke. But I'm not oh, 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 <laughs> Papa. Good evening, Papa. I am most displeased. It is quite in order that you young people should visit your sister of an evening and have a few quiet words with her, but I think I've pointed out not once but several times that in her very precarious state of health it is inadvisable for more than three of you to be in her room at the same time. 
My wishes in this matter have been disregarded, as usual. I am gravely displeased. <laughs> I am not aware that I have said anything amusing, Henrietta. I beg your pardon, Papa. And may I ask what you were doing as I came into the room? I was showing Ba how to poke. To poke? How to dance the polka. I see. <coughs> well, Ba, I think I'll say good night. I should be grateful if you would kindly allow me to finish speaking. Sorry, sir. I th thought you'd done. Are you being insolent, sir? No, indeed, sir. I assure you, I... Very well. Now... As I'm really the cause of your displeasure, Papa, I ought to tell you that I like nothing better than a little noise occasionally. It, it's delightful having all the family here together and can't possibly do me any harm. Perhaps you will forgive my saying, Elizabeth, that you are not the best judge of what is good or bad for you. And that brings me to what I came here to speak to you about. Dr. Chambers told me just now that you persuaded him to allow you to discontinue drinking porter with your meals. It needed very little persuasion, Papa. I said I detested porter, and when you dislike a thing to loathing, I don't see how it can do you any good. Self-discipline is always beneficial, and self-indulgence invariably harmful. But, Papa... Did you drink your porter at dinner? No. Then I hope you will do so before you go to bed. No, Papa, that's really asking too much. I can't drink the horrible stuff in cold blood. Very well. Of course, I have no means of coercing you. You're no longer a child. But I intend to give your better nature every chance of asserting itself. A tankard of porter will be left at your bedside. And I hope that tomorrow you'll be able to tell me that you have obeyed your father. I'm sorry, Papa. But I shan't drink it. Henrietta, go down to the kitchen and fetch a tankard of porter. No. I beg your pardon. It's sheer cruelty. You know how Bar hates the stuff. The doctor's let her off. You're just torturing her because you like torture. I have told you to fetch a tankard of porter from the kitchen. I won't do it. Must I ask you a third time? Obey me this instant. Papa, go and fetch it, Henrietta. Go at once. I can't stand this. No. Please, please. Oh, very well. You had all better say good night to your sister. Good night, dearest. Good night. Good night, Bar. Good night. Good night, Pa. Good night. Good night, Pa. Good night. Oh. Here, the portal bar, darling. No, give it me. There. Now you may go. Good night, dear. Good night, Pa. Yes. Why do you look at me like that, child? Are you frightened? No. You're trembling. Why? I, I don't know. You're not frightened of me. No, no, you mustn't say it. I couldn't bear to think that. You're everything in the world to me. You know that. Without you, I should be quite alone. You know that, too. And you, if you love me, you can't be afraid of me, for love casts out fear. You love me, my darling. You love your father. Yes. And you'll prove your love by doing as I wish. I was going to drink the porter. Yes, out of fear, not love. Oh, listen, dear, I told you just now that if you disobeyed me, you would incur my displeasure. I take that back. I shall, I shall never in any way reproach you. You shall never know by deed or word or hint of mine how much you have grieved and wounded your father by refusing to do the little thing he asked. Oh, Papa, let us get this over and forget it. I can't forgive myself for having made the whole house miserable over a tankard of porter. Give it to me, please. You're not feeling worse tonight, my darling? No, Papa. Just tired? Yes, just tired. <sighs> I'd better leave you now. Shall I say a little prayer with you before I go? Please, Papa. Almighty and merciful God, hear me. I beseech thee and grant my humble prayer. In thine inscrutable wisdom, thou hast seen good to lay on thy daughter Elizabeth grievous and heavy afflictions... Give her to realize the blessed word that thou chastisest those whom thou lovest. Take her into thy loving care tonight. 
purge her mind of all bitter and selfish and unkind thoughts. Guard her and comfort her. These things I beseech thee for the sake of thy dear son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good night, my child. Good night, Papa. Come in. Are you ready for your bed now, Miss Burr? Oh, Wilson, I'm so tired. Tired, tired of it all. Will it never end? End, This long, long, grey death in life. Oh, Miss Burr, you shouldn't say such things. No, I suppose I shouldn't. Wilson, open the door. I'm expecting visitors this afternoon, and I want the room to be quite fresh for them. Oh, I wish we could open the window. Open the window, Miss Oh, Hall. yes, I know. It's strictly forbidden. Well, open the door wide. Oh, I'll best cover you well up, first of all. This is this, Miss Bath? Yes, my cousin, Miss Bella Headley. I haven't seen her since she was a child, and such a lovely slip of a child. And now she's just become engaged. Please, Miss. And is she bringing her young gentleman with her? Yes. And uh, Mr. Robert Browning is calling later. Oh, indeed, miss. Is he the gentleman who's always sending you such lovely bookies? Yes. Oh, that will be nice for you. Now, are you sure you don't feel a draught, Miss Barr? Quite, thanks. Wilson. Yes, miss. Have you noticed anything uh, strange in me today? Strange, miss? Yes, strange. I mean, dull-witted, thick-headed, stupid, idiotic. Oh, no. no. What, well, perhaps a bit absent-minded like, but that isn't anything for you to worry about, Then Ms. you don't Bart. think I'm going mad? Well, that's mad. Uh, very well, now. Listen carefully and tell me what you make of this. And after for pastime, if June be refulgent with flowers and completeness, all petals, no prickles, delicious as trickles of wine poured at mass time, and choose one indulgent to redness and sweetness... Or if, with experience of man and of spider, June used my June lightning, the strong insect ridder, to stop the fresh film work, why, June will consider. Well? Oh, I call that just lovely, Miss Barr. But do you know what it means? Oh, no, Miss. Does it convey anything at all to your mind? Oh, no, Miss. Thank heaven for that. But, well, the poetry never does, miss. Leastways, not real poetry, like what you make. <laughs> but I didn't write that. It's by Mr. Browning. Oh, he must be a clever gentleman. Oh, yes, he's all that. May I come in? Orky, dear, what on earth are you doing at home at this time of day? Pa's bright idea suggested I should take a half holiday to help you... Feed and entertain the love birds. <laughs> well, then, I want you to be very diplomatic. Captain Surtees Cook is calling at the same time as Bella and Mr. Bevan. He's coming to see Henrietta. And I've arranged for Arabelle to bring Bella and Mr. Bevan up here to see me. You must come with them. Why? So that Henrietta can have Captain Cook to herself for a little while. Oh, yes, quite so. I, I see. And uh, you don't look in the least ashamed of yourself. I'm not. But does it occur to you, my dear Bar, that we may be doing Henrietta an uncommonly bad turn by encouraging this b budding romance? Yes, but I think we ought to chance that. Oh, Bar, they've arrived! And in state, the Bevan Barouche powdered footman and all. Go and help Arabelle receive the mocky. Mm. I'll wait here till Captain Cook arrives. I'm going to let him in, and then you and Arabelle can bring Bella and Mr. Bevan up here. All oh, cut and dried, what? But, but look here. What's wrong I... with you, do you hear? What's the time? Uh, five minutes past three. Past three? Past three. I don't understand. He said three. But oh, today is Thursday, isn't it? Yes, dear. Oh, I thought perhaps I'd made a mistake. Oh, I wish he were able to come in his uniform. That would take the curl out of Mr. Bevan's whiskers. <laughs> oh, there he comes. I can see him from the window. Oh, I'll 
see if she's ready. Oh, I'm so happy. Are you ready to receive them? Yes, quite. Uh, what are they like, Oki? Oh, she's a dream of loveliness and he's so Bella, dear. Ba, dearest Ba, after all these years. But, oh, my poor, poor Ba, how sadly you've changed. So pale, so fragile, so ethereal. And you, Bella, are even lovelier than you promised to be as a child. <laughs> Flatterer, you hear that, Howie? This is my dear, dear Howie, Mr. Bevan, Miss Elizabeth Barrett. Delighted, Miss Barrett. Charm. No, 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 Howie. You must take her hand, like this. Oh, such a little hand. So frail, so spiritual. And the hand that pens so much that is noble and eloquent. I am honoured, Miss Barrett. Thank you. And may I congratulate you, both of you. I hope you will be very happy. Thank you, Miss Barrett. I am indeed a fortunate man. Dear Howie, dear Bar. But won't you sit down? Uh, thank you. I adore your poems, Ba. Especially when dear Harry reads them, he too adores your poems, which ought to please you as he's dreadfully critical. Oh, come, come, my pet. Oh, but Harry, you are. He doesn't quite approve of even Mr. Alfred Tennyson's poems. Really, Mr. Bevan? I have nothing against them as poetry, no, indeed. What grieves me, Miss Barrett, is that his attitude towards sacred matters is all too often an attitude tinged with doubt. Now, your poems, my dear Miss Barrett, show no touch anywhere of these modern tendencies. There's not a line in one of them that I would disapprove of even dear Bella reading. <laughs> That's very satisfactory. Dear Howie is so frightfully earnest. Oh, come, come, my pet. But now tell me, my dear, when is the wedding to be? Or am I being indiscreet? Not at all. We Oh, back... that reminds me. Where's Henrietta? The wedding? Early in August. Where's Henrietta? At the moment she's downstairs entertaining a friend. Oh, I wanted to ask a, a friend. Not that tall gentleman we passed in the hall. Yes, Captain Surtees Cook. <gasps> in the army? How thrilling. I thought his bearing was military. You wanted to ask Henrietta something? Oh, yes. Oh, Ba, I do so want her to be one of my bridesmaids. Do you think... Henrietta. Bella, dear. Henrietta, darling, I was just saying you must be one of my bridesmaids. You simply must. Oh, I should love to, Bella. It's sweet of you to ask me. And, of course, I will if Papa... Oh, I don't see how he could possibly object. Object? But I don't understand. Isn't she funny, Ba? You only asked to be a bridesmaid, darling, not a bride. Yes, I know, but... Oh, it's so hard to explain. Perhaps Mr. Barrett looks on bridesmaids as frivolous irrelevancies of so solemn a sacrament as marriage. No, it's not that. It's, it's simply that nothing in this house must happen without Papa's sanction. You know he once owned slaves in Jamaica, and as slavery's been abolished there, he carries it out in England. I'm quite serious. We're all his slaves. Henrietta. Yes. Well, aren't we? Aren't we, Oki? Aren't we, Ba? We can't move hand or foot without his permission. I tell you, Bella, it's more than likely that he'll refuse to let me be your bridesmaid for no rhyme or reason except that he's out of temper. I say, what, what about teeth? Oh, yes, how lovely. Teeth's quite ready. I'm sorry I forgot to tell you. Good heavens, let's hurry or, or Captain Cook will have swallowed it all. He's gone. Oh. Are we for dirt, you dear, as far? It's been so lovely seeing you. May I come soon again? Come whenever you like, dear. Good day, dear Miss Barrett. Goodbye. It was nice of you to come and see me, Mr. Bevan. Not at all. I have long been looking forward to the honour of meeting you. Good day. Goodbye. Goodbye, dear. Well, why don't you say something? What do you want me to say? Nothing. Oh, Ba, don't scold me. I know I deserve it. I've been dreadful. But I couldn't help it. Oh, I'm so miserable. Miserable, dear? Yes, and so... so wildly happy. Oh, Ba, dear, may I tell you about it? Go on. Certes has just asked me to marry him. Oh, my dear. And of course I accepted him and said that I couldn't. What? And I had to tell him that we must never see each other again. When he calls here tomorrow, we shall have You're to... You're not talking sense, child. What really has happened? Oh, I don't know. Except that we both love each other terribly. Oh, Pa, what are we to do? Certes has only just enough money to keep himself decently. And, of course, I haven't a penny of my own. 
If only I had your 400 a year, I might defy Papa and leave the house and marry Surtees tomorrow. And what earthly good is that money to me? I'd give it to you and how gladly. I know you would, darling, but that's utterly impossible. Just think what your life would be like if Papa knew that you'd made it possible for me to marry. Pa, dear, is there anything, anything at all to be said for Papa's attitude towards marriage? Can it possibly be wrong to want a man's love desperately and to long for babies of my own? No. But who am I to answer a question like that? Love and babies are so utterly remote from my life. Yes, I know, dear. You're a woman apart. But love and babies are natural to an ordinary girl like me. What's natural can't be wrong. No. And yet the holiest men and women renounce these things. I dare say, but I'm not holy. And come to that, neither's Papa, not by any <laughs> means. Didn't he marry? And he's... Come in. Mr. Robert Browning is called Miss... Mr. Browning? Yes, Miss. Well, then I'd better be off. No. No. Henrietta, stay here. I can't see him. I don't feel up to it. I can't. Wilson, tell Mr. Browning I'm very sorry, but I'm not well enough to receive that's him. That's not true, Ba. You can't send him away like that. It'd be too rude and unkind after having asked him to call. Where is Mr. Browning? I showed him into the library. But I, I'd mu much rather not see him. Oh, fudge, you're not a silly schoolgirl. I'll bring him up myself. Oh. Is my hair tidy? Oh, yes, Miss Bell. Oh, Wilson, please arrange the rug. Thank you. And Wilson? No. Thank you. That will do. Yes, Miss. Mr. Robert Browning. Miss Barrett? Mr. Browning, how do you do? Dear Miss Barrett. Oh, at last! At last! I've had to put off the pleasure of meeting you much longer than I would have wished. Would you ever have received me if I hadn't been so tiresomely insistent? As you know from my letters, I've not been at all well during the winter, and I'm... <clears throat> I hope you don't find the room very close, Mr. Browning. Oh, oh. My doctor obliges me to live in what I'm afraid must be to you a hothouse temperature. Wonderful. You may think, Miss Barrett, that this is the first time that I've been here. You're quite wrong. You know. What? I have seen this room more times than I can remember. It's as familiar to me as my own little study at home. Before I came in, I knew how your books were arranged, just how that tendril of ivy slanted across the window panes, and those busts of Homer and Chaucer, quite old friends, and have looked down on me often oh, before. Really? But I could never make out who the other fellows were on the top of the wardrobe. Oh, come, <laughs> Mr. Browning. I know that dear Mr. Kenyon is never tired of talking about his friends, but I can't believe that he described my poor little room to you in detail. I dragged all the details I possibly could out of him, and my imagination supplied the rest. Directly after I had read your brave and lovely verses, I was greedy for anything and everything I could get about you. You frighten me, Mr. Brown. Why? Well, well, you know how Mr. Kenyon's enthusiasms run away with his tongue. He and I are the dearest of friends. What he told you about poor me, I quite blush to imagine. He never told me anything about you personally which had the slightest interest for me. Oh? Everything he could give me about your surroundings and the circumstances of your life I snatched at with avidity, but all he said about you was quite beside the point because I knew it already. Oh, Mr. Browning, do my poor writings give me so hopelessly away? Hopelessly. Utterly. Entirely. To me. I can't speak for the rest of the world. You frighten me again. No. But you do. For I'm afraid it would be quite useless my ever trying to play act with you. Quite useless. I shall always have to be just myself. Always. Oh. And you too, Mr. Browning. Always, myself. <laughs> but really, you know, Miss Ballard, I shan't be able to take much credit for that. Being myself comes to me as easily as breathing. It's play acting I can't manage, and the hot water I've got into in consequence. Yes, I can well believe that. Now I know you. But isn't it extraordinary? When you're writing, you never do anything else but play act. I know. You've never been yourself in any one of your poems. It's always somebody else speaking through you. Yes. Shall I tell you why? I am a very modest man. Oh? I am, really. 
I didn't question it, Mr. Brown. So modest. I, I fully realize that if I wrote about myself, my hopes, my fears and hates and loves and the rest of it, my poems would be intolerably dull. <laughs> Well, since we're pledged to nothing but the truth, I won't contradict that until I know you better. <laughs> Bravo. Oh, but those poems. Their glad and great-hearted acceptance of life. You can't imagine what they mean to me. Here am I, shut in by four walls, the view of Wimpole Street, my only glimpse of the world, and they troop into the room and round my sofa, those wonderful people of yours, out of every age and country, and also tingling with life, life. Oh, no, you'll never begin to realize how much I owe you. You, you really mean that? Why, of course. Well, of course you do, or you wouldn't say it. And you'll believe me when I tell you that what you have just said makes up to me a thousand times over for all the cold shouldering I've had from the public. Oh, it infuriates me. Why can we never know an eagle for an eagle until it has spread its wings and flown away from us for good? Sometimes I detest the British public. Oh, no, no. No, my dear old British public... At least it gives me generously the jolly pastime of abusing it. And mind you, Miss Barrett, I have an uneasy feeling that my style is largely to blame for my unpopularity. Oh, surely not. But didn't we agree never to play act with each other? <laughs> Touché. <laughs> well, perhaps there are passages in your work a little involved. I mean, a little too... Too profound for the general reader. Oh? Oh, no. Well, it's not what I say, but how I say it. Oh, but... Uh, and yet to me, it's all simple and easy as the rule of three. And to you? Well, not quite always. Sometimes there are passages... Um, um, I'd mark one or two in your Sordello, which rather puzzled me. Here, for instance. Oh, Sordello. Somebody once called it a horror... Of great darkness. <laughs> I've done my best to forget it. However, uh, that's extraordinary. Uh, a passage torn from its context. Well? Ah, well, Miss Barrett, when that passage was written, only God and Robert Browning understood it. Now, only God understands it. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? Shall we lighten this great darkness by pitching it on the fire? No, indeed. We, we shall do nothing of the kind. Please give me back the book. Oh. No, I insist. Such passages are only spots on the sun. I love Sordello. You would. Of course you would. And shall I tell you why? Because it is a colossal failure. If by failure you mean an attempt... Yes, you're right. That's just why Sordello appeals to my very heart. I, too, am always making colossal attempts and always failing. Isn't one such failure worth a hundred small successes? Oh, a thousand and more. You think so, too? Oh, but of course I know that. Miss Barrett, you smiled when I told you that Kenyon had no need to describe you because I knew you through and through already. And what you have just said about success and failure proves to me finally how right I was. All Kenyon did was to fill in the background. I had painted my portrait, my portrait of you with the true soul of you, ardent and lovely looking out of it. Ardent and lovely? If you think you know me? Oh, Mr. Browning, too often impatient and rebellious. Well, what of it? I've no love for perfect patience under affliction. My portrait is the portrait of a woman, not a saint, who has more right to be impatient and rebellious than you. Did Mr. Kenyon paint my background with a very gloomy brush? Old Rembrandt would have envied him. Poor dear Mr. Kenyon. I suppose he told you that I am a dying woman. We are all of us dying. And that our family life was one of unrelieved gloom? Yes, he hinted at something of the sort. He really shouldn't say such things. Frankly now, Mr. Browning, do you find me such a very pitiable object? I find you as I expected to find you, full of courage and gaiety. And yet, in spite of what you say, I'm not at all sure that Kenyon's colors were too somber. But... Miss Barrett, you say my verses have helped you. They're nothing. It is I who am going to help you you now. We have come together at last, and I don't intend to let you go again. But Mr. Brown... No, listen. 
Give me your hands. I have more life than is good for one man. It seethes and races in me. Up to now, I've spent a little of all that surplus energy in creating imaginary men and women. But there's still so much left that I've no use for but to give. Mayn't I give it to you? Don't you feel now new life tingling and prickling in your fingers and arms and into your heart and brain? Oh, please, Mr. Browning, please let go my hand. Well? You, you really are a rather overwhelming person and in sober truth, I... No, no, please don't tell me again that you're afraid of me. You're not. It's life you're afraid of, and that shouldn't be. Life? Yes. Miss Ballard... Do you remember the first letter I wrote to you? Yes, indeed. It was a wonderful letter. You may have thought I dashed it off in a fit of white-hot enthusiasm over your poems. I didn't. I weighed every word of every sentence. And of one sentence in particular, this sentence. I love your books with all my heart. And I love you, too. You remember? Yes, and I thought it charmingly impulsive of you. Well, I tell you, there was nothing impulsive about it. That sentence was as deeply felt and anxiously thought over as any sentence I've ever written. <laughs> I hope I have many readers like you. It's wonderful to think I may have good friends all the world over whom I have never seen or heard of. I'm not speaking of friendship, but of love. No, it's quite useless you're trying to put aside the word with a smile and a jest. I said love. And I mean, love. But, Mr. Browning... I'm neither mad nor morbidly impressionable. I am as sane and level-headed as any man alive. Yet all those months since first I read your poems, I've been haunted by you. And today you are the center of my life. If I were to take you seriously, Mr. Browning... It would, of course, mean the quick finish of a friendship which promises to be very pleasant for both of us. Why? You know very well that love, in the sense you apparently use the word, has no place and can have no place in my life. Why? For many reasons, but let this suffice. As I told you before, I am a dying woman. I refuse to believe it. For if that were so, God would be callous. And I know that he's compassionate, and life would be dark and evil, and I know that it's good. You must never say such a thing again. I forbid you to. Forbid, Mr. Brown? Yes, forbid. Isn't it only fair that if you forbid me to speak of you as I feel, and I accept your orders as I must, that I should be allowed a little forbidding as well? Yes, but... <laughs> Oh, dear Miss Barrett, what a splendid beginning to our friendship. We have known each other a bare half an hour, and yet we've talked intimately of art and life and death and love, and we've all each other about, and we've almost quarreled. Could anything be happier and more promising? Uh, with your permission, I'm going now. I can see that you are tired. When may I call again? I don't quite know. I... Will next Wednesday suit you? Yes, I think so, but perhaps it, it would be next better... Next Wednesday, to... then? Uh, but, um... At half past two? Yes, but I... Au I... revoir, then. Goodbye. Au revoir. Au revoir. Let me see you walk again, Miss Barrett. Shall I? Capital. My dear Miss Barrett, I congratulate you. Now sit down. Uh, when exactly was it you last called me in for consultation, Dr. Uh, Jeffers? Three months ago, almost to a day. Well, you've done wonders, Doctor. Oh, mine was just the ordinary spade work. The real healer is no one but Miss Barrett herself. The wish to live is better than a dozen physicians. Well, now, about the future. I fully agree with Dr. Chambers that another winter must, if possible, be avoided. If you continue picking up strength as you are doing, I see no reason against your travelling south by October, say. 
Travelling? South? To the Riviera, or better still, to Italy. Italy? Oh, Doctor, do you really mean it? Why not? You could travel there by easy stages. There are no practical difficulties in the way of your going there. Oh, if by practical you mean financial, none at all. I've uh, taken the liberty to tell Dr. Fort Waterloo of the only real difficulty in the way of your wintering abroad, and he is quite prepared to deal with it. Quite and drastically. Oh, I'm sure that won't be necessary. Papa may not raise any kind of objection. It, it depends how he's feeling at the time. Phil six, my dear young lady. Mr. Barrett's feelings are neither here nor there. All that matters is his daughter's health and happiness, as I intend to make clear to him, quite clear. Uh, goodbye, my dear Miss Barrett. No, please, don't get up. I'm delighted with your improvement. Delighted. Goodbye. Goodbye, Doctor. Goodbye, Miss Elizabeth. Goodbye. Italy. Italy. And you're coming with us too, Flashy. We'll see Rome together. Arabelle, it's all but settled. I'm to go to Italy. They said that I shall be quite fit to travel by October. Rome, Florence, Dante, Sodello. Oh, I don't know what I'm saying. I'm quite off my head with excitement. Oh, how wonderful for you. I'm so glad. You think Papa will consent? But of course he will. Both the doctors are putting it before him as strongly as they can. Oh, surely he'd never have the heart to refuse when he realizes all this Italian trip means to me. Oh, dear, no. Have you seen him this afternoon? Yes. Well, what was he like? Oh, quite sunny. He called me Puss, and he never does that when he's in one of his moods. And afterwards, when Bella came in, he was really merry. Oh, thank heavens for that. May we come in? Bella, dear. Henrietta, how perfectly lovely you look, and what a beautiful girl. Do you really think so? Bella insisted on my trying it on. Dear Henrietta, will be quite the prettiest of my bridesmaids. Indeed, I'm afraid she'll draw all eyes from the little bride. <laughs> At any rate, all the gentlemen... But, darling Ba, you really mustn't stand about like this. Why not? I'm as well able to stand as anyone now. <laughs> Fancy, Ba, if I hadn't spoken to Uncle Edward myself, I should never have had her for my bridesmaid. Yes, my dear, you certainly have a way with you. Spoken to Papa, I like that. Why, you sat on his knee and stroked his whiskers. Oh, Henrietta, dear. <laughs> and why not? Isn't he my uncle? Besides, I adore that stern and gloomy type of gentleman... But what I can't understand is his extraordinary attitude towards love and marriage. Didn't he marry himself? And what's more, have eleven children? Oh, have I said anything very dreadful? No, dear, but perhaps not quite nice. Uh, when God sends us children, it's not for us to inquire how and why. I didn't mean to be irreverent, but I do find dear Uncle Edward's attitude extraordinary and so useless, for in spite of it, his whole house is literally seething with woman. <laughs> what an extraordinary girl you are, Bella. Oh, I'm a frightfully observant little thing. For instance, though you hardly ever mention his name, I know that for the last three months, Mr. Watson. Robert Browning comes here to see you at least once every week, and at other times he sends you flowers. But of course, I won't breathe a word of it to Uncle Edward. I'm all on the side of romance. Oh, Bella, I regret to say it, but I think you are one of the few girls I know who would have benefited entirely under Papa's system of upbringing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a thrilling thought. He was always frightfully strict, wasn't he? Did he whip you when you were naughty? How frightfully exciting to be whipped by Uncle Edward. Come in. Whoa, Uncle Edward. Uncle dear, if I had been your little girl instead of Papa's, would you have been terribly severe with me? You wouldn't, would you? Or would you? Would, wouldn't, wouldn't, would you trying to pose me some silly riddle? No, 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 no. Sit down and I shall sit on your knee. Oh. It's like this. Arabelle says it would have done me all the good in the world to have been brought up by you. She thinks I'm a spoiled, frivolous little baggage. Bella, I never said anything of the sort. I know you didn't, but you do. But you don't, Uncle, do you? Oh, really? If Bella. my children were as bright and open and as affectionate as you are, I should be a happier man. Oh, you mustn't say such things or they'll hate me. And you're a distractingly lovely little creature. Anything wrong in that? I didn't say so. Then why do you look at me so fiercely? Do you want to eat me up? What's that scent you have on you? 
accent? Me? <laughs> Don't you like it? It's very delicate and subtle. Still, I should prefer you not to use it. Why? Never mind. Whoa! That hurts. Nonsense. Run away now, child. I want to speak to Bar. You others can go too. Yes, Papa. Goodbye, Uncle. Goodbye. Goodbye, Bar. Goodbye, Bella. When is the wedding? The wedding? Oh, Bella's on the twenty seventh. Good. Less than a fortnight. We're not likely to see much of her till then, and afterwards, well, she'll be living in the country most of the year. But I thought you were so fond of her, Papa. Fond of her? Why not? Isn't she my niece? But she's a disturbing influence in the house. See your brothers following her about with their eyes, especially Octavius. The room's still full of her. I shall be glad when she's gone. But I don't want to talk about Bella. Your doctors have just left me. Yes, Papa. The report is excellent. Astonishing. I'm more than gratified. I'm delighted. Of course, my poor child, it's unlikely that you'll ever be a normal woman. Even Chambers, optimistic fool though he is, was forced to admit that. Papa? Well? Didn't the doctors tell you that I should avoid spending next winter in England? Well? And that they think I shall be fit to travel to Italy in October if you... So it's out at last. And how long has this precious plot been hatching, may I ask? Well, it's now several weeks since Dr. Chambers first mentioned Italy as a real possibility. I see. And do your brothers and sisters know anything of this delightful project? I believe I mentioned it to them. But, oh, Papa, what does it matter? My only reason... Matter not in the least. It's nothing at all that I should be shut out of my favorite daughter's confidence, treated like a cipher, ignored, insulted. Insulted? Believe me, Papa, my one reason for not worrying you with this Italian idea before was that I... The fear that I should dip it in the bud at once, exactly, I quite understand. But that wasn't... No, I beg you, spare me explanations and excuses. There's nothing more to be said. But there is more to be said. And I must beg you to listen to me, Papa. How many years have I lain here? Five, six, it's hard to remember, as each year has been like ten. And all that time I've had nothing to look forward to or to hope for but death. Death. Yes, death. And when life brought me little happiness and much pain, I was often impatient for the end. Elizabeth, I'm shocked. And now you... this miracle has happened. Day by day, I'm better able to take and enjoy such good things as everyone has a right to. Able to meet my friends, to breathe the open air and feel the sun and see grass and flowers growing under the sky. When Dr. Chambers first spoke to me of Italy, I put the idea from me. It seemed impossibly wonderful. But as I grew stronger, it came over me like a revelation that Italy wasn't an impossibility at all, that nothing really stood in the way of my going, that I had every right to go. Right. Yes, right. If only I could get your consent. So I set about consulting my friends, meeting all obstacles, settling every detail, so as to have a perfectly arranged plan to put before you after the doctors had given you their opinion. In my eagerness, I may have acted stupidly, but to call my conduct underhand and deceitful is more than unkind. It's unjust. And it's cruel. Self, self, self. No thought, no consideration for anyone but yourself or for anything but your pleasure. But Papa... Didn't it even once occur to you that all through those long, dark months you proposed to enjoy yourself in Italy, your father would be left here utterly alone? Alone? Utterly alone. Your brothers and sisters might well be shadows for all the companionship they afford me. And you... Oh, my child, don't think that I haven't noticed that you too, now that you're no longer wholly dependent on me, you're slowly drawing away from your father. It's not true. It is true. And in your heart you know it's true. No. New life, new interests, new pleasures, new friends. And little by little I am being pushed into the background. I, who used to be your whole world. I, who love you, who love you, Elizabeth. But, Papa... No, there's nothing more to be said. You want my consent for this Italian jaunt. I shall neither give it nor withhold it. You are at liberty to do as you wish. And if you go, I hope you will sometimes spare a thought for your father. Think of him at night, stealing into this room which once held all he loved. Think of him kneeling alone by the empty sofa and imploring the good shepherd. Who's that? Come in. If you please, Mr. Browning is called. Oh. That fellow again. I showed Mr. Browning into the drawing room, Miss, seeing Miss Hugh was engaged. 
Would you like to meet Mr. Browning, Papa? Certainly not. I should have thought you knew by this time I never inflict myself on any of my children's friends. You may show Mr. Browning up, Wilson. Very well, good, sir. Mr. Browning appeared to consider this his second home. I have not seen him since last Wednesday. Indeed. Then I shall leave you to your tete-a-tete. Will you come up, if you please, sir? Mr. Browning. Oh, but how splendid. <laughs> This is the fourth time you've received me standing. If I ever receive you from my sofa again, you may put it down to my bad manners and nothing else. I will with all my heart, I will. And now tell me quickly, you've seen them, what do they say? Well, Dr. Ford Waterlow was quite taken out of his grumpy self with astonished delight at my improvement. Say that again. Oh, really, must I? The whole sentence? I should like to see it in letters of fire burning at me from each of these four walls. <laughs> This is the best moment I've had since I got your note giving me permission to call on you. And Italy, are both doctors agreed about your wintering there? Yes. And when do they think you'll be fit for travelling? The middle of October, unless there's a relapse. Relapse, that isn't such a word. October, extraordinary. For, you know, October suits my own plans to perfection. Your plans? Well, don't you remember my telling you that I'd thought of wintering in Italy myself? Well, now I'm quite decided. May I call on you often in Italy? Where do you intend to stay? <laughs> Why are you laughing? In Italy, I'm afraid you'll need seven league boots when you call on me. What do you mean? I shall be at 50 Wimpole Street next winter. Here? Yes. But didn't you tell me that both doctors... Doctors may propose, but the decision rests elsewhere. Your father? Yes, sir. He has vetoed the plan. Uh, no, not exactly, but I'm quite sure that it will be impossible for me to go. But didn't the doctors make it clear to him that this move of yours may mean all the difference between life and death? I believe Dr. Ford Waterloo spoke very forcibly. Then, in heaven's name... Oh, I... it's rather hard to explain to someone who doesn't know all the circumstances. You see, Papa is very devoted to me Devoted? And... I don't understand a devotion that demands favours as if they were rights. Demands all and takes all and gives nothing in return. I don't understand a devotion that grudges you or any ray of light and glimpse of happiness and doesn't even stop at risking your life to gratify its colossal selfishness. Devotion. <laughs> Give me good, sound, honest hatred rather than devotion like that. Mr. Browning, you must not speak like that. Forgive me. But I won't be silent any longer. Even before I met you, I knew that sickness wasn't the only shadow of your life. But who was I to step in between you and the man nature as an ugly jest chose for your father? Please, Mr. Browning. Must don't... I pretend to know nothing, see nothing, feel nothing? Well, I've done with pretense from today on. It's not just your comfort and happiness which are at stake now. It's your very life. I forbid you to play with your life. And I have the right to forbid you. No. 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 Oh, please, don't say anything. The right. And you won't deny it. You're utterly candid and true. At our first meeting, you forbade me to speak of love. There was to be nothing more than friendship between us. I obeyed you. But I knew well enough... We both knew that I was to be much more than just your friend. Even before I passed that door and our eyes first met across this room, I loved you. And I've gone on loving you. And I love you now more than words can tell. And I shall love you to the end and beyond. You know that. You've always known. Yes. Yes, I've always known. And now, for pity's sake, for pity's sake, leave me. No, I shall never leave you. Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Oh, Robert, have mercy on me. Elizabeth, my darling. Oh, Robert, I love you. I love you. And yet you ask me to take my marching orders and go out of your life? Yes. For what have I to give you? 
I have so little of all that love asks for. I have no beauty and no health and I'm no longer young. I love you. Oh, oh Robert. I think Eve must have felt as I did when her first dawn broke over paradise. The terror, the wonder, the glory of it. I had no strength to put up any kind of resistance except the pitiful pretense of mere friendship. I was helpless. I was paralyzed with a happiness I'd never dreamt it was possible to feel. That's my only excuse, and God knows I need one for not having sent you away from me at once. I love you. My life had reached its lowest depth, and then you came. Robert, do you know what you have done for me? I could have laughed when Dr. Chambers said that I'd heal myself by wanting to live. He was right. I wanted to live. Eagerly, desperately, passionately. And only because life meant you. You. And the sight of your face. And the sound of your voice. And the touch of your hand. And with these words singing in my ears, I'm to turn my back on you and go. I love you. And I want you for my wife. Oh, Robert. I can't marry you. Not today or tomorrow. Not this year, perhaps, or next. Perhaps not for years to come. I may never be able to marry you. Yes. Robert, if we were to say goodbye today, we should have nothing but beautiful memories of each other to last to the end of our lives. We should be unhappy, but there are many kinds of unhappiness. Ours would be the unhappiness of those who have put love away from them for the sake of love. There would be no disillusion in it, or bitterness, or remorse. Is it you who are speaking? What do you mean? I thought yours was the courage that dared the uttermost, careless of defeat. I never thought you were a coward. A coward? I... Yes, I am a coward, Robert. Coward through and through, but it's not for myself that I'm afraid. I know that, my darling. What's another disaster to me? You've known little but disaster all my life, but you are a fighter. And you were born for victory and triumph. If disaster came to you through me... Yes, a fighter, but I'm sick of fighting alone. I need a comrade at arms to fight beside me. But not one already wounded in battle. Wounded, but undefeated, undaunted, unbroken. Yes. And what finer comrade could a man ask for? But, Robert... No. But, Robert... No, Elizabeth. No. My dear Elizabeth, this is to let you know that we shall be leaving London on Monday, the 22nd of this month... I have taken a furnished house at Bookham in Surrey, and we shall spend the winter there. I have felt for some time now that your present feverishly restless mode of life in London will, if continued, affect you harmfully both physically and morally. I am writing this letter so that you may inform your brothers and sisters of my decision before I return home tomorrow. That's today. Oh, Robert, don't you see what this means to us? It will soon be made impossible for me to see you at all. This letter means all that. But it means a great deal more that you haven't as yet been able to grasp. A great deal more? It means that you will be in Italy before the month is out. Italy? Yes, and with me. Robert. It means that we must be married at once. Do you know what you're saying? Yes, I know what I'm saying, and I repeat it. We must be married at once. My darling, listen. No, don't touch me. I can't marry you. I can never marry you. You can and you shall. You'll marry me if I have to carry you out of this house and up to the altar. Oh, Robert. It's no use deceiving ourselves. However much stronger I may become, I shall always remain an invalid. As your wife, I should be haunted day and night by thoughts of all the glorious things you could have enjoyed. But for me, haunted by the ghosts of your unborn children. Listen. When I first read that letter, my world seemed to fall to pieces. But now, I thank God that it came while we're still free. 
and have the strength to shake hands and say goodbye. Goodbye. Robert. On the whole, I think this will be our best plan of campaign. The family leave here on the 22nd, so we have barely a fortnight to get everything done in. You told me last week that your sisters were invited to a picnic in Richmond Park next Saturday, so the house will be conveniently empty. We'll meet at Mary Lebone Church and be married quietly sometime in the morning. I'll see about a license at once and interview the vicar. Robin! Directly after we're married, I think you had better return here and take things very easily for a day or two. You'll have, let's see, six days if we leave on Saturday week. Now... The packet leaves the Royal Pier at Southampton on Saturdays at nine o'clock. We must catch the five o'clock express at Vauxhall. Bar, <laughs> 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 my dearest. <laughs> oh, and, and I always believed. Papa was the most overbearing man in the world. <laughs> and yet you've known me for some time now. But there's one other thing, my darling, that we must settle at once. You can't possibly travel without a maid. Do you think Wilson would be willing to come abroad with us? Robert, have you ever thought that my strength may break down on the journey? Yes. Suppose I were to die on your hands. Are you afraid, Bob? Afraid? You know I would sooner die with you beside me than live a hundred lives without you. But how would you feel if I were to die like that? And what would the world say of you? I should be branded as little better than a murderer. And what I should feel, I, I leave you to imagine. And yet you ask me to come with you? Yes. I am prepared to risk your life, and much more than mine, to get you out of this dreadful house and into the sunshine, and to have you for my wife. You love me like that? I love you like that. Robert, will you, will you give me a little time? Time is short. Yes, I know, but I must have a little time. I can't decide now. I daren't. I feel something must happen soon to show me definitely the way. Give me a few hours. Before I sleep tonight, I'll write and tell you my decision. Please, Robert. You promise that? I promise. Very well. Thank you. Shall I go now? Please. Au revoir, my darling. Come in. I saw Mr. Browning going down the stairs. May I bring him in? Him? Wake up, Ba. I'm talking of certies. You said I might. Oh, yes, of course. But won't some other time do as well? No, no, he's outside on the landing. I told you he was in uniform. Well, you promised to see him, Bar. Very well, dear. <gasps> Come in, Surtees. Captain Surtees Cook, Bar. My sister Elizabeth. Your servant, Miss Bannard. How do you do? Greatly honoured. On my word, I am. <laughs> I understand that not everyone received here. No, indeed, Surtees. With the exception of the family, very few gentlemen have ever been allowed in Bar's room. Twice honoured in one day, you know. First by Her Majesty, now by you, Miss Barrett. <laughs> Can't think what I've done to deserve it. Oh, I'd forgotten. You've just come from the palace. <laughs> I've never seen the Queen. What is she like? A very little lady, ma'am. But royal, every inch of her. Surtees, you haven't got your sword on. Uh, uh, not etiquette to wear it indoors. Oh, bother etiquette. I want Bar to see you in full war paint. Where did you leave it? In the hall. I'll fetch it. Uh, uh, no, but really, Miss Barrett doesn't want... But indeed I do, Captain Cook. I don't think I've ever seen an officer in full war paint before, <laughs> except at reviews and ceremonies. And <laughs> that was years ago. Indeed. Uh, Miss Barrett. Yes, Captain Cook. 
I say, Miss Barrett. You want to tell me something about Henrietta? Just so, Miss Barrett, just so, exactly. You know, Miss Barrett, you know... Yes, uh, Captain Cook, I know. And though I am quite powerless to help, believe me, you have my heartfelt sympathy. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Barrett, more than I deserve. Never was such a girl, you know. Henrietta, I mean, don't know what I've done to deserve. Yes, the sort. (laughs) Oh, Oh, yes, I thought he'd seize the opportunity to tell you something while I was out of the room. Did he really manage to tell you? Perhaps not quite, (laughs) did you, Captain Cook? (laughs) Well, you know, still, like most ladies, quick on the uptake. My dear, how I wish I could do something for you both. Well, you can't, favourite daughter though you are. Stand still, Certes, I'm going to buckle this on you. Certes wants to ask Papa for my hand and all that, quite like the conventional suitor. I can't get it into his poor head that such things are simply not possible at 50 Wimpole Street. Oh, believe me, Captain Cook, it would be more than useless. You would be peremptorily ordered out of the house. I'm quite aware that I'm not much of a match, Miss Barrett. A poor man, you know, little else than a pay. Still, decent family and all that. Should be more than willing, if necessary, to throw up children and take to some money-making business. Oh, but I say, Henrietta, you've got it wrong. Sword hangs from the left hip. You well, know. it looks very nice all the same, doesn't it, <laughs> Ma? Oh. Papa, you returned home earlier than I expected, Papa. I don't think I have the privilege of this gentleman's acquaintance. Captain Cook, may I introduce my father? Papa, Captain Surtees Cook. Your servant, sir. Captain Cook is a great friend of George and Ockie. Indeed. My sons are very rarely at home at this time of the day. The fact is, just passing the house. Thought I'd look in on the off chance, you know, sir. Finding one of them in and all that. I see. Captain Cook has just come from Buckingham Palace, and Henrietta thought I should like to see him in all the splendour of his regimental. Indeed. Nothing much to look at, of course, but ladies like a bit of colour, and... uh, by Jove, must be getting late. It's uh, 19 and a half minutes past five. By Jove, a high time I were moving. Goodbye, Miss Barrett. Goodbye, Captain Cook. Goodbye, uh, Miss Henrietta. Your servant, sir. I'll see you out. Henrietta. I'm seeing Captain Cook to the door. The servant will attend to that. I wish you to remain. Elizabeth, you received my letter? Yes, Papa. What has just happened fully confirms me in the wisdom of my decision. This house is fast becoming a rendezvous for half London. Fortunately, our new home is so far away from town that your London friends are not likely to trouble us, at least during the winter. Our new home? I don't understand. Are we leaving Wimpole Street? I have taken a house at Bookham in Surrey, and we move in on the 22nd. Why? I am not in the habit of accounting for my actions to anyone, least of all to my children. One thing I have a right to ask you, Papa. If Captain Cook is to be forbidden to visit us, is it because you found him here in Bar's room and saw me fastening on his sword? I understood you to say that Captain Cook is George's friend and Ockie's. Yes. And my friend, too. Ah. And since it was I who suggested his seeing Bar, and I who asked him to show me how to buckle on his sword, it's unjust to penalise him. Come here, Henrietta. Yes, Papa. Come here. What is this fellow to you? I told you, he's a friend of ours. What is he to you? A a friend. Is that all? Yes. Papa. Let me go. What is this man to you? Answer me. Answer me. Papa, please. Answer me. Oh, Papa, I love him. Let her go, Papa. I won't have it. Let her go at once. You, you, Elizabeth, you knew of this filthiness. I've known for some time that Henrietta loved Captain Cook, and I've given her all my sympathy. You dare to tell me you... Yes, and I would have given her my help as well if I had it to give. I'll deal with you later. Oh, Papa, listen to me, please. I know I've deceived you, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but I couldn't help it. I love him. We love each other. And if you'd known, you would have turned him from the house. Can't you understand? He's poor. We don't expect to be married yet. But he's a good man, and it can't be wrong to love him. I want love. I can't live without love. Remember how you loved Mama, and how she loved you, and you'll understand and pity him. How long has this been going on? 
How long have you been carrying on with this fellow? I've known him a little over a year. And you've been with him often? Yes. Alone? Yes. Where? We... I... I've met him in the park and... And... Here? Here. And alone? Have you met him in this house alone? Yes. So furtive, unchastity under my own roof, and abetted by one whom I believe to be wholly chaste and good. No, no! Silence! Henrietta, attend to me. Unless I have your solemn word that you will neither see nor in any way communicate with this man again, you leave my house at once, as you are, with nothing but the clothes you have on, in which case you will be your own mistress and can go to perdition in any way you please, but of this you may be certain. Once outside my doors, you will never again be admitted on any pretext whatever, so long as I live. You have your choice. Take it. Pa! Will you give me your word neither to see nor to communicate with this man again? I have no choice. Very well. You will now go to your room and remain there until you have my permission to leave it. Have you anything to say to me, Elizabeth? Any excuse to offer? No, Papa. Then I must leave you under my extreme displeasure. You have betrayed my confidence. I can have nothing to do with you until God has softened your heart and you repent of your wickedness and ask for his forgiveness and... and mine. That's it. My mind is made up. You rang for me, miss? Yes. Shut the door, please. Wilson. Are you my friend? Your friend, miss? Yes, my friend. I'm in dire need of friendship and help at the moment. Well, I don't quite understand, Miss Barr. But I'd do anything to help. Would you? And I know I can trust you. Yes, indeed, miss. Wilson, next Saturday I'm going to marry Mr. Browning. Miss Mary? Shh, shh, shh. Yes. Of course, nobody in this house knows, and nobody must know. Oh, Lord, miss, I should think not indeed. We're to be married secretly at Mary Lebone Church. Will you come with me? Um, me, miss? Oh, yes, Miss Van Directly afterwards, I shall return here for a few days. Here, yeah, with Mr. Brown? No, no, no. Just alone with you. Then, on the following Saturday, I shall join Mr. Browning, and we're going abroad. We're going to Italy. Will you come with us? To Italy? Yes. Will you come with me? Well, miss, I can't see how, how I can help myself. Husband or no husband, you'll never get to Italy without me. Then you'll come. Oh, I'm so glad. I'll tell Mr. Browning I'm writing to him now, and I shall want you to take the letter to the post at once. Go and put on your things. I'll have it finished by the time you're ready. So you see, Papa, I and my husband are going to Italy to live. Forgive me. Elizabeth. Oh, Miss Byron, that's sorry. In my flurry to get the luggage off to the railway station yesterday, I clean forgot to pack these rugs. Oh, never mind. I don't hope we haven't forgotten nothing now. If we have, it won't matter much. We shall be able to get all we need in Paris. Oh, no, Miss. It doesn't seem possible. We'll be in Paris no. tomorrow. <laughs> Oh, our time crawls. We're still an hour and a half of this dreadful waiting. You're sure, Wilson, they quite understood at the livery stables exactly when and where the cab was to meet us? Oh, yes, miss. The corner of Wimpole Street, a half past three punctual. It won't take us more than ten minutes to get to Hodgson's library. And then Mr. Browning will have us in his charge. Your husband, Shh, Miss... Oh, don't breathe that word oh, yes. Miss No, I'm so foolishly nervous. I, I, I can't help it. It's a very wall thing to be listening. There's no one in the house, I know, except Miss Henrietta, and she should have gone out by now, oh, but... Miss Henrietta still... was just putting on a bonnet as I came along the passage. Have you finished writing your letters? Yes, yes, I have written to them all to wish them goodbye. I've just been reading over my letter to Mr. Barrett to see if there was anything, something I could add, mm -hmm. something. 
anything. Oh, Miss Bob. <laughs> I know I shouldn't say such things. But there's a lot I'll give to be here tonight when the master reads your letter and knows you've been a married lady for almost a don't, week. Don't, Wilson, don't. The very thought terrifies me. I can see his face. I can hear his voice. Thank God we shall be miles and miles away. Wilson, I want to speak to Miss Barr. Very good, Miss. I thought you were going out, Henriette. I was just going when I ran into a messenger at the door. He brought a letter from Surtees, Captain Cook. Well? You remember Papa made me swear not to write or see Surtees ever again? Yes. I'm going to break that oath today. Are you, dear? Yes, and I shall glory in breaking it. Surtees' regiment has been ordered abroad and he leaves on Wednesday, so I must see him today or, or on Tuesday, no matter where. I shall meet him both days. I see. But why do you tell me all this? Because I want you to say that I'm a wicked, deceitful, perjured, loose woman so that I can fling the words back in your face. Oh, Bar, darling, forgive me. I'm all love and hate these days. I don't know which is the worst torture. My dear, you think I don't understand. But I do. Oh, I do. And I pity you with all my heart. But never lose hope. Never lose courage. Never. Oh, Miss Barr! Miss Barr! Look at the door, Henrietta. What is it, Wilson? It's the master, Miss. He must have heard. Someone must have told him. Oh, what on earth is the matter? Nothing, nothing. Wilson, put my hat and cloak away, quick. Oh, yes, Miss Barr, I don't understand. You're as white as a sheet. What did Wilson mean? Is there anything... No, no, don't speak. Don't ask me anything. You know nothing. Understand? Nothing, nothing. But... No, those rugs. Wilson, hide them at once. <laughs> Come in. Come in. You're home early, Papa. Oh, What's the matter with that girl? Wilson? Yes, and with you. Nothing, Papa. Why a hat, Henrietta? Where have you been? Nowhere. Where are you going? To tea with Aunt Hedley. Is that the truth? Yes. Well, you can go. I want to speak to your sister. Do you know why I'm back so early, Elizabeth? No, Papa. Because I could bear it no longer. It's ten days since I last saw you. Am I to blame for that, Papa? You dare to ask me such a question. Weren't you a party in your sister's shameless conduct... Did you expect to go scot-free at my displeasure? But I did not come to speak about that. I wonder, my child, have you been half so miserable these last ten days as your father? Miserable, Papa? Do you suppose I'm happy when I'm bitterly estranged from all I love in the world? Do you know that night after night I had to call up all my willpower to hold me from coming here to forgive you? Papa? All my sense of duty and right and justice. But today I... I could face it no longer... The want of your face and your voice became a torment. I had to come. And I despise myself for coming. Despise myself. Hate myself. No. Papa, can't you see? Won't you ever see that strength may be weakness and your sense of justice and right and duty all mistaken and wrong? What do you mean? No, no. No, be silent. Don't answer me mistaken and wrong. You, you don't know what you're saying. If only you listen to me, Papa. No. I... But, Papa... No. If there were even a vestige of truth in what you say, my whole life would be a hideous mockery. For always, through all misfortunes and miseries, I've been upheld by knowing beyond a doubt what was right and doing it unflinchingly, however bitter the consequences and bitter they've been, how bitter only God knows. It's been my heavy cross that those whom I was given to guide and rule have always fought against the right that I knew to be the right and was in duty bound to impose upon them, even you, even your mother. My mother? Yes, your mother. But not at first. You, my eldest child, were born of love and only love. But the others, long before they came, the rift had begun to open between your mother and me. Not that she ever opposed me, never once, or put into words what she felt. She was silent and dutiful and obedient. But love died out, and fear took its place. Fear. No. No. And all because I saw the right and did it. Oh. Oh, dear God. 
what she must have suffered. And all his children born in fear. Oh, it's horrible. It's horrible. Ah, my dear, don't, don't, don't. I, I shouldn't have spoken. I shouldn't have told you. No, don't, don't look at me like that. You, you don't understand. How should you? You know nothing of the brutal tyranny of, of passion. And how even the strongest and best are driven by it to hell. Would you have abetted your sister in her filthy... And yet his love. How dare you speak of it in the same breath I as... I love you, ignorant little fool. What do you know of love? Love. The lust of the eye, the lowest urge of the body. I won't listen to you. You shall. It's time a little reality were brought into your dream of life. Do you suppose I should have guarded my house like a dragon from this so-called love if I hadn't known for my own life all it entails of cruelty and loathing and degradation and remorse? Through years of tormenting abstinence, I strangled it in myself. And so long as I have breath in my body, I'll keep it away from those I was given to protect and care for. You understand me? Yes, I understand. Very well. This has been a hateful necessity. I had to speak plainly, lest your very innocence should smirch the purity I'm utterly resolved to maintain in my home. Oh, but for God's sake, my darling, don't let this raise any further barrier between us. I've told you how all these past months I've seemed to feel you slipping little by little away from me. Your love is all I have left to me in the world. You had Mama's love once. You might have had the love of all your children. Yes, if I'd played the coward's part and taken the easier way. I'd rather be hated by the whole world than gain love like that. Oh, Papa. You don't know how I pity you. Pity? I don't want your pity. But if I should ever lose you or your love, my darling, next week we shall have left this house in our new home. We shall draw close to each other again. There will be nothing, and no one will come between us. My child, my, my darling, you want me to be happy. The only happiness I shall ever know is all yours to give or take. You must look up to me and depend on me and lean on me. You must share your thoughts with me, your hopes, your fears, your prayers. I want all your heart and all your soul. I can't bear it. I can't bear it anymore. My dear, I was carried away. I, I'll leave you now. Please. Shall I see you again tonight? Not tonight. I shall pray for you. Pray for me? Tonight. Yes, pray for me tonight. If you will. Good night. I must go. I must go. Where's my cloak? My bonnet? He's gone to the study, Miss. We must go. Now, at once. But Miss Barr, the cab won't be there yet. Not for an hour. Besides, then we must walk about the streets. I can't stay here any longer. I'm frightened. I'm frightened. Walk about the streets, Miss. You can't. You can't. Besides, the master's at home. He may see us leaving for God's sake. Miss. Where did I put those letters? Oh, yes. Yeah. Ivy's was leaving. We must chance that. He can't stop me. I don't belong to him anymore. I belong to my husband. Papa can kill me, but he can't stop me. I daren't, Miss. I daren't. Then I must go alone. Well, you can't do that. Wilson, things have passed between my father and me, which forced me to leave this house at once. Until today, I've never really known him. He's not like other men. He's dreadfully different. I can't say any more. If you want to draw back, you need never reproach yourself. This, after all, is no affair of yours. But I must go now. I'll fetch my things, miss. Wilson. Is this? See whether the study door is shut. Door shut and all is quiet. Very well. I'm quite ready. You take the rugs, Wilson. I'd better carry the flush. Come on, boy. Very good, miss. I'll wait for you. 
you here. But hurry. Hurry. And don't make a By Jove, what the devil's the matter? It's, it's Ma. She, she's married. She's gone. Yes. Arabelle, pull yourself together. What are you saying? Where's Ma? She married Mr. Robert Browning. Browning, the poet fellow. Oh, she's Browning. gone. These letters. She's written to all of us. There's, there's one for, 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 for Pa, too. Pa. Is he in? Dressing for dinner. Well, someone must give him Ba's letter. Let me. I should love to. Oh, shh. What is the meaning of this? Why are you all in here? Oh, where's Elizabeth? Adam will answer me. Do you hear? Where is your sister, Henrietta? She left you this letter. Left me? What do you mean? She left letters for all of us. This is yours. Ah. You must forgive her, Papa. You must forgive her, not for her sake, but for yours. I thought I hated you. But I don't. I pity you. And if you've any pity for yourself, forgive her. I and my husband are going to Italy to live. Yes. Yes. A dog. Yes. I'll have her dog. Octavia, sir... Her dog must be destroyed at once. But, Papa... You will take it to the vet tonight, you understand me? Tonight. You understand me? I, I really d don't see what the p p poor little beast has done. You understand me? In her letter to me, Barr writes that she has taken flush with her. In the Barretts of Wimpole Street by Rudolph Bessier, Dorothy Tutin played Elizabeth, Paul Rogers was Mr. Barrett, and Jeremy Brett played the part of Robert Browning. Arabelle was played by Kate Binchy, Henrietta, Jane Knowles, Octavius, Christopher Good, Bevan, Kenneth Fortescue, Bella, Helen Worth, Captain Cook, Michael Kilgariff, Dr. Chambers, Rolf Fever, Dr. Ford Waterlow, John Ruddock, and Wilson, Sheila Grant. Mr. Barrett's other sons were John Rowe, William Edel, John Sampson, Robin Brown, and David Valor. The play was produced by Archie Campbell. <laughs>